Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the PCI PAL results presentation. Uh, to begin with, if we could cover a couple of housekeeping items. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, which you will see on your screens. Uh, throughout this presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. However, questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen, or if anyone is dialed in via PCIPAL at warbrookpr.com. Uh, the company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate. These will be available via your InvestorMeet company dashboard. Uh, finally, we would like to remind you that this presentation is being recorded. Now, I'd like to hand you over to Chief Executive James Barham and Chief Financial Officer William Good. Thank you, Tom. Uh, welcome everyone to our half year update for FY22. Uh, it's been another really strong period of progress here at PCI PAL and uh, certainly looking forward to taking you through uh, these half year results today. Uh, thanks for joining us as well on the IMC platform. Uh, for those that know us, you know that we use this platform to make ourselves more accessible to a wider, a wider investor audience. Um, we've built up a pretty good backlog of IMC presentations on here to help investors get a good, good grasp of our story, um, our messaging uh, and our, our long term plans for the business. So, so please, if you do want more background, do, do check out some of our uh, earlier presentations as well. To kick us off today, I'll be giving an overview of our strategy uh, and then I'll move into the, uh, the half year update and financial review from uh, uh, William. Uh, before I do move on, I did want to say a few words on the patent dispute that we first reported to the market in September. <clears throat> uh, I know that I know that for many of you, this is going to be front of mind. So I wanted to deal with it at the front end of the presentation to allow us to spend more time focused on the uh, the financial and operational updates, uh, which uh, which frankly are very strong. So it, it might also be quite difficult for us to answer some questions at the end on this. But so unless it's something fairly straightforward. Uh, we may not be able to answer the question because, you know, obviously we've got a, a legal case underway at the moment. So as a uh, as a reminder, uh, this case relates to uh, alleged infringement of, uh, of IP rights concerning one element of one of our products. Uh, the, the overriding feel um, from me really is one of uh, frustration, particularly as, as we were the first in our space to do what we do in the cloud with our own IP. Uh, we've been a disruptor in our market, and those of you that have followed us since the beginning will, will know that story very well. And we've, we've really transformed the way that companies could access secure payment systems in, in business uh, communications environments. So, so the situation is fairly frustrating from a, a sort of business standpoint, but the bottom line right now is, is positive. So we're, we're very confident in our position. We have been since, since day one, and there's reasons for that. Uh, our position is multifaceted in terms of the ways we're able to defend ourselves on, on non-infringement specifically. But additionally, the counterclaims we're, we're making on, on validity as well are very, are very strong. Um, it's important to note, as, as we've stated before, we have always taken legal opinions as we've evolved our, our product set to ensure we do not infringe any third parties' IP rights. So, you know, those, those things wrapped together, we have a, a very strong defense. We have high levels of confidence around this situation. Uh, and, and frankly, with the strong performance of the business, uh, we're very well resourced to, to see this process out uh, if we need to. Now, I think I should say as, as an executive team, as a board, as with anything we do at PCI Power, we always consider uh, all the options available to us. And we'll continue to do that as we as we proceed down this path. But certainly whatever we do is working towards the best outcome for the company and uh, and therefore our, uh, our shareholders. OK, now I'd like to try and get on with the with the good stuff now, uh, the business progress, uh, which has been been very strong. And uh, uh, William and I are, are really excited about uh, what we're doing in the business today and what we've what we've got coming down down the track. So. A little bit of background for those new to the story. Um, PCI Power is a, a fast-growing uh, SaaS business. We, uh, we facilitate secure payments for organizations that use our solutions, use our services. Um, and we do this securing of payments across all business communications environments. 
So by business communications environments, we particularly mean contact centers and, and the omni-channel mix that goes into that, that sphere. So voice or phone and the more common today or certainly growing digital channels such as chat, web chat, uh, social media, email, all of these that go into the contact center or call center mix. So basically, if a payment interaction is occurring anywhere outside of a website or in a store, uh, we, we get involved. Now, not only do we secure data, but we enable compliance with relevant uh, data security standards as well, uh, and particularly the global standard that governs the protection of card data, payment card data, which is known as PCI compliance, payment card industry compliance. And by using our services, our customers make their journey to compliance with that standard uh, 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 much, much easier, and it can also support their compliance to other uh, uh, guidelines that are out there or regulatory standards such as um, GDPR, for instance. Uh, we're cloud only, true SaaS product set, uh, and we can deliver as a result anywhere in the world. And our focus to date has been, we talk about our EMEA region, but the focus within EMEA has very much been the UK and our North America region, which our focus has very much been uh, the US, but um, we are uh, very much uh, ex expanding as well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to you a bit about that today. In terms of our products, we're very simple. So three core products, Agent Assist, Digital, and IVR. Uh, Agent Assist is, is involved in securing payment data in live agent phone calls with customers. Uh, digital is a live agent digital interaction with a customer. So that would be web chat or social media, like I mentioned just now, or IVR, which is the sort of industry term for auto, auto attendant or automated services, um, which can also be uh, used with speech recognition too. We're a, we're a primarily channel-led business, so majority of our business comes through uh, resellers, and that's some of them shown on the slide there, and I'll, I'll take you through that uh, uh, later and give you an update on that. And then also uh, just an example of some of our awards, which you can feel free to dig into uh, afterwards. Uh, the highlight on there being some of the People Awards that we've been winning this year, which is kind of testament to our, our focus in our people, uh, which has been particularly important given the competitive hiring market right now. Getting into a, a snapshot of the year, so strong increase in revenue year on year, 72% up, um, ahead of our management expectations, um, not significantly, but it was ahead of management expectation. I'll let William talk a bit more about the revenue uh, growth in detail. Um, we're continuing to drive new business sales through our key sort of future indicator of um, recurring revenue, which is TACV. So that stands for total annual contract value. And that's the total annual contract value of all contracts that we have, whether they're live or not, i.e. whether they're revenue recognition or not. And that today is at um, 11.4 million. So you can see that's not too far away from what we're anticipating doing in our market forecast for the full year. Another two key metrics for us that I look at particularly uh, that we introduced at the end of the last financial year, uh, NRR, net revenue retention and uh, churn and our management of churn and minimalizing that. So. I think we're proving with that kind of performance at 120% NRR and our churn rates less than 5% that you know, not only are we winning business, we're keeping it and we're growing it too. Uh, and that's kind of the utopia that, that, that we want to get to. This, this, this has been something I've been particularly uh, uh, keen on uh, as, we, as we've brought further focus on this because we've got more opportunity here as we evolve our product, product set, adding features and more opportunity to do more with the customers that we win. So we work very hard to, to win those customers in the first place. Other, other highlights here for the half year, uh, partner ecosystem is critical to us. I uh, have a bit more of a deep dive on that, but you know, we, we do have the strongest partner ecosystem in our, in our market by, by some margin. We've been completely committed to channel uh, since the, the, the day one of this journey. Uh, we're very targeted about the businesses that we try to align ourselves with, and we've won a number of new, um, really interesting regional and global partners in the first half. Uh, and we've also got a very strong pipeline of new uh, global partnerships as we look out into uh, into H2 as well. And just, just for a moment, I will talk about uh, people, uh, which is not new for us. We've always talked about people. Majority of our cost base is, is people, and that's what, that's what drives this business forward. But that's been brought into sharp focus in the last six months with the, uh, the war for talent that's been, been going on and sort of hit us two or three months into the, uh, into the financial year. But I'm pleased to say, whilst that's been a headwind and been a challenge, I think we've kind of won that wrestling match. So we've adapted the way we're working with recruiters, adapted um, how, how we were hiring um, and not put too much pressure either on our budgeted um, pay scales either. So we've been quite creative there, uh, really worked on our employer brand and, 
And I'm also pleased to say with that, we've been able to, to maintain employee retention high, which is tracking pretty much today about 90%, 90% plus. So uh, yeah, very, very happy with that. And I think that's a testament to the, uh, to the sort of culture that we've built here at PCI Power. Um, in terms of the strategy, very simply, three key pillars to our strategic um, growth. And they are to be the leader for cloud solutions in our space, uh, for our solutions to be available to customers anywhere in the world, and to leverage a sales model that by majority sells through um, channel partners. And, and we think we're being very successful uh, in, in, uh, in, in developing and progressing uh, along those, uh, those strategic avenues. Got a slight delay on the uh, on the slides. Excuse me. Uh, in terms of our uh, global presence, we we'll split this into two two places: so cloud and the sort of global establishment strategy. So focusing on cloud for a moment. So key competitive differentiator for us, uh, as I say, first to launch cloud uh, in our market by some margin, and we have the most mature cloud platform uh, in that market as a result of that. Um, it's also one of the key reasons we've been successful with other aspects of our strategy. So in particular, um, success in working with uh, partners. Uh, many of our resellers are cloud companies themselves, global cloud companies, uh, many of them very large US headquartered organizations. And so we sort of set out our stall to be the go to cloud vendor for these cloud part, uh, companies to want to work with. Um, it's also a reason why we're able to serve the small to mid-size end of the contact center market very efficiently. And coming into this space, that was always critical for us because the vast majority of the contact center market globally, sort of 90% uh, or more is, is, is less than 100 agent seats. So the vast majority is small to mid-size uh, and cloud gives us the ability to be able to, to do that. Now our cloud is hosted in uh, Amazon Web Services, so AWS fully virtualized. Uh, and as you can see from the six, six padlocks on the slide there, we've got six regional instances of that, of that platform that we can, um, we can scale very quickly and at um, significant, uh, significant pace. And in terms of the geographic point, uh, in April last year, we went through a fundraise um, and that was to support an expanded um, uh, development plan for us to grow our addressable market by up to 40 percent over the over the next 18 months. Um, and we've made good progress against that. Uh, and the initial plans were that we would we would launch in Canada, and we have achieved that in the first half, at the back end of the first half. Uh, and we've also, since uh, the end of H1, uh, launched in Australia too. So we actually have people on the ground in those territories now, being able to work with our existing partners who have have offices there. So um, yeah, really, really looking forward to seeing um, the pipeline starting to come come together in uh, in those territories as well. Now, we've also been investing as part of that fundraise in product, so product development, product marketing, and uh, that's been progressing well too, but we're going to see the majority of those uh, ben benefits starting to come through in the, uh, in the second half. In terms of the ecosystem and giving you a bit of an update, so I said we're channel-led, 81% of our contracts come through partners. Um, we, we're a channel-first business, so that means we still do business direct as well. Majority of our direct customers tend to be more enterprise in nature. Uh, and we do have some of the largest contact centers in the UK, for example, who use us through uh, direct agreements with us. Um, that tends to typically be where we sell, where we sell direct. Um, we are a pure play organization. So that means we, we're only focused on secure payments uh, and that makes us much more attractive to many of these partners. So there's no perception that we might compete with them trying to cross sell products that might potentially tread on their toes, which we know has been a challenge for other competitors of uh, of ours. Um, we're completely committed to channel with the people we have, the processes we have, the technology that we've built, and all of those things underpin how we've been able to be successful in building a strong uh, partner ecosystem. Now, on the left hand side of that slide, you'll see that we split our partners into four groups. I'm not going to spend a long time talking through those because I have done it on some of our much earlier presentations. So please feel free to go back to those if you'd like to listen through. But the, 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 the short point is we have a very joined up and focused and tactical approach to uh, how we how we treat partners work once they're onboarded, enabled, and then we're getting them into business as usual and producing for us. In terms of partner highlights uh, in the period, um, Amazon probably probably one to choose from that. So the Amazon deal that we announced in H1. So Amazon customers can now procure PCI power services through AWS Marketplace, which is the Amazon uh, technology marketplace. We're the first vendor in our space to achieve this globally. 
uh, and we have a fully approved um, in integration there. So we're going through partner enablement with uh, Amazon at the moment, um, and that's Amazon Connect customers, um, which is Amazon's cloud contact center platform uh, in particular that we're, we're focused on there. But as you imagine, Amazon's a very large organization, so uh, enablement, onboarding, and, and getting that moving will, uh, will take a little bit of time. Um, now, we've, we've, we're, we've signed other various global companies in the period, all of them on our target list at the start of the year. And I'll talk a little more about those at the regional regional breakdown. Um, and then finally, I would say that we've really upped our game in terms of our relationships with existing partners coming into the year. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen the emergence of marketplaces, for instance, which may make it a bit easier for competitors to get into those environments. So we've actually been taking it up a notch with many of these organizations where we've built up a lot of trust, we've built up strong customer bases. So actually, we're becoming the solution of choice for uh, many of many of these resellers, and I'd highlight a company like Genesis, for instance, where uh, we're an App Foundry premium uh, partner, which is a fairly fairly exclusive group. But we, you know, we got that off the back of uh, our hard work and focus getting to that point. So that's enough on the background. I'm going to hand over to to you now, William, um, for the uh, for the financial update. Uh, thank you, James. So. Um... Uh, as James indicated, very you know, we're very happy with the uh, with the numbers that are, are flowing through into the business. They're you know the continuing the trend, the strong growth that we've set out over the last five years and have reset out in April to drive the business further forward. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that uh, from my point of view, all the all the key metrics we have are in the green. If you use a traffic light system, which we do, um, and some of them are right at the top end of uh, of the performance criteria we're looking for. So um, yeah, you'll you'll recognise the formats of uh, the presentation. I try and keep things consistent for you, so you can see the comparisons and the performance going forward. So these are just some of the key financial highlights. Um, as I say, we're making significant progress against all the uh, all the key metrics. So the the top um, left hand uh, box there is the revenue. So it's up seventy two percent, as James said, um, year on year for you know, period to period. So we did five point four seven million. In the first half of the year, and you can see there, I've kind of outlined um, the the forecast that's in the city at ten point nine. Actually, it's it's just been increased by our brokers to eleven point one million, uh, and we're well on track for for achieving that. And if you if you take that into context, um, we're on target for doing eleven million pounds. You go back four years, we did two million pounds revenue. So we've uh, we've increased revenue five and a half times in that four year period. And I mean, as we set out in uh, April 2021, we're looking at driving that from 10 times in six year period. So we're, you know, we're, we're, we're achieving that. More importantly, on the uh, right hand side, uh, the gross margin continues to improve. So not only are we driving revenue, we're keeping more of it um, to pay our bills. So revenue improved by, by 8.4% uh, half on half. And that has allowed us to in, uh, increase our uh, adjusted EBITDA. Now the adjustments I take out our uh, exchange movements. I take out the cost of the patent, which I'll talk about later, and also share options. So the adjusted EBITDA for the for the half year was just a shade under six hundred thousand um, pounds, and uh, the statutory loss uh, on the basis was one point one million when you when you put everything back in. Um, that uh, adjusted EBITDA was a fifty seven percent improvement. The other key metrics or some of the key metrics we look at are uh, our annual contract value, the, the value of contracts that we sign uh, in, as new contracts uh, in the year. Uh, we call it ACV. Um, that's performing well. That's up 6% um, period to period at 1.76 million. Um, please bear in mind that the, the comparison was quite strong uh, as we had uh, as we were coming out of the, the first impact of the pandemic coming through in the, in the comparator. Um, but also bear in mind that um, this delivery is on roughly the same level of salespeople we had the previous year. Now, we have taken on new headcount. Um, we have expanded it, as James said, into Canada, into Australia. We've added people in, 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 in the United States. But typically, it takes four to six months before those people actually sign their first deals. And then it takes another, you know, another time before it actually starts filtering through to revenue. So. Uh, we're looking forward to that growth continuing, um, uh, and we're you know we're targeting 3.7 million there or thereabouts in the uh, full year. 
the new ACV is one of the key drivers that drives our TACV number that James mentioned, and that's up 37% half, half on half um, at 11.34 million. And for those that have been following us for a little while, um, when we you know, did the presentation in September, I outlined that we are looking for uh, to achieve TACV in FY22 of about 13.1 million pounds by, by the time we get to June 2022. Um, so we're well on track for doing that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, more importantly, recurring revenues continue to grow. Um, you know, 90% of our revenue is now recurring. Um, uh, that's that's uh, on the basis of our you know, of our deliberate plan to make sure that we you know, we don't charge up front. We work with our clients, and so we have recurring revenues. Um, and finally, the the, the other highlight is cash balances. We finished the period with 5.5 million. That is substantially ahead of where we are expecting to do coming into the year because of the strong performance of the business. And again, I'll talk a bit more about that in the next few slides. So looking at TACV in a bit more detail, <coughs> some, some of you will recognize this, uh, this graph. I keep it going. Uh, you can see the half on half growth coming through. So it's grown 19% since June, 2021. And the little white box at the top, the 1.8 box at the top, is the amount we've got to do to take it up to the 13.1% um, forecast I uh, put in the market in September. So why is it growing? Well, it's growing because we're signing new customers, but also we're not losing that many customers. James talked about churn. It's a focus for us. It always has been. Yeah, There's no point signing customers and then have them switch off after 12, 24 or 36 months. Uh, and so we you know, we measure that and we started publishing those stats to you uh, in September. As at December, uh, based at, you know, uh, our churn is down at 3.5%, which is right at the top end, you know, the lower end of our uh, of our uh, target. So you know, anywhere between 3 and 8% is seen good for a SaaS company, and we're at 3.5%, um, but clearly we're focusing on that. Net retention, as James mentioned, is another key key metric. So not only are we successfully signing in new logos and bringing them in, but a good proportion of our sales are now coming from upsells to existing clients, be that new licenses or be that um, being introduced to other parts of, their, uh, of these global businesses we've signed. And we've been very successful in rolling that out uh, over the period and expect to continue that into the second half of the business. Just looking at TACV a bit more, um, this is the split by region. The charcoal bar on the, in the graph on the uh, left-hand side uh, represents EMEA, which again is growing uh, strongly and continuing to grow strongly. The orange bar is North America, and as I remind people, eventually the North American bar will overtake um, uh, the uh, EMEA because it's a bigger market, but it just takes time to get that momentum building. The table on the right-hand side is very important to us as a business. Um, that's the split of the TACV. So TACV is the measure of all the contracts we have signed um, and still valid. Um, so if council, if a contract is cancelled, it's taken out of TACV. Uh, but the split is, is, is important because obviously we can only recognise revenue under the accounting rules once they go live. So our ARR, um, which is the deployed contracts, has grown from 5.89 million to 8.96 million, so a three million pound jump in the tw in the last 12 months, and that that leads to the you know, to the regular monthly recurring income dropping through. At the end of December, we had a further 1.89 million in active deployment. Um, so our TTGL, which some some of you uh, will you know, will remember, is our metric we use to how quickly we get uh, a business uh, a sign a contract from signature through to revenue recognition. Um, in the period, we achieved 22 weeks. Typically, it's 22, 24, 26, somewhere in that in that region. So we're on track for that, just at the top end of it. Um, and so that 1.89, all things being equal, will get deployed and we'll get we'll drop into the ARR, boosting the ARR up towards you know, the 11 million pounds as we come into FY23. You'll also see there's an element of on hold contracts. These contracts um, we declare because they relate to either where customers need to put extra resource in to get going, and they're part of a, or they're part of a bigger expansion, a rollout of changes in that in that customer, 
or they've come through a, uh, a channel partner and that channel partner is selling new to the end customer. And so they have to put their business in, you know, their processes in first before we can get switched on. So um, that, you know, those contracts, yeah, they do roll over. Eventually they come into deployment and then go through, but they typically take a longer pay, longer time to go live. Just looking at the revenue, uh, again, revenue is growing strongly. So um, the graph on the left-hand side, the 5.0, that, that represents our recurring revenue. And the little orange blob on the top represents our uh, professional services release under the uh, rules of IFRS 15. So we do charge upfront fees. Um, they're worth 1.2, 1.5 million to us every year. Those then get um, held and start uh, getting amortized once the contract goes live in line with the normal IFRS 15 accounting process. Now, within our revenue, we have had um, some strong tailwind, some strong tailwinds boosting us, um, which is why we have achieved 72% year on year, which is ahead of our own expectations. So firstly, where we, where we upsell and where we upsell with new licenses, the time to go li live on those are a lot shorter than obviously a new contract coming through. And so, so we can switch them on and start recognizing revenue. That's probably added 100, 150,000 pounds to, uh, to the revenue this year. Um, and then we'll flow through into the second half and onwards. Um, in addition, we do uh, in some uh, use telephony uh, minutes to help connect our services to contact centers. And those minutes are related to, um, to you know, calls coming in. And if we're receiving more calls, we get more revenue. So one of our customers has been substantially busier than we expected and has generated an extra 250,000 pounds worth of minutes uh, in, the, in the period. Now those are high, you know, not, not as high margin as, as licenses as you would expect, but it's still an important revenue earner and gross margin earner for us. That strength in growth of revenue has allowed us to increase our, our forecast revenue in the period. So if you remember, we came into the year with a forecast of 10.4 million. We raised it when we did the trading update to 10.9, and we just raised it again to 11.1 million, um, driven by those, by those factors. And again, the gross margin is 81%, so more and more of that is dropping to the bottom line. I do expect the gross margin to continue to improve because the AWS platform, which we sell on primarily, is our own. Um, and so that will head up, as I've said in previous presentations, to north of 85, maybe even 90%. Just looking at the income statement in more detail, clearly I've talked about the revenues and the cost of sales and the gross margin, so I'm not going to uh, talk any more about that. But I will highlight the staff costs there, which has grown by 36%. Now that's because we're taking on more staff because of the April 21 fundraise, which you know, we set out our stall to uh, to continue to expand this business and grab additional um, uh, TAM, uh, so addressable, addressable markets. So our headcount in the period has gone from 71 as at the end of June 21 to 86 as at the end of December. And we're now just in the low 90s uh, as we speak in, uh, in the end of February. Um, that's all part of the plan. We haven't held back on the plan because we have been funded for it, um, even though the patent you know, is, is, uh, has come into the equation as well. Um, you'll see the loss from oper you know, the operating loss uh, for the business has uh, improved from 2.1 to 1.1. Now, that's a statutory operating loss. Um, so it includes all the exchange gains, losses, and other sort of adjustable items. So below that, you'll see I've taken it out. So the biggest movement is the exchange gains and losses. So in the prior period to, you know, to December 20, we actually had an exchange loss of 366,000 because the US dollar went from 1.35 up to 1.4. Conversely, in this period, it's dropped back from 1.5 1 back down to 1, uh, so 1 1.4 back to 1.35. So it's reversed itself again. That's why I strip it out. All that exchange loss relates to the revaluation of the sterling loans that the PLC has made to the US. It's no cash implication at all. You'll see the exceptional cost line in there. So, you know, the patent case that you know James mentioned in the beginning, we have spent two hundred eighty-five thousand pounds to the end of December um, with legal fees. I've treated that as an exceptional cost, and clearly those costs are expected to continue. So, if you look at the FinCap forecasts. 
we're expecting a uh, a loss of uh, a, a cost of up to six hundred and fifty thousand pounds in the full year for to June FY um, to June twenty two. Um, and then there's the extra expenses from share options. So taking those out, the adjusted operating loss is only it has improved by 39%. So it's one, you know, 1037 against 1.7 million pounds, a very strong performance and above our expectations. Just looking at cash, um, cash, we've used 2 million pounds worth of cash in the business, which is you know, actually slightly, you know, which is actually less than we were expecting to when we went into the year because of the expansions we were, uh, we, we've been pressing uh, in headcount. You'll see that's up markedly from the prior period. Why is that? Well, just as a reminder, in the prior period, we did receive from our largest US customer an advance payment for year two and year three licenses, which total $1.13 million. Um, so that, that is uh, recognized in the deferred income line. The deferred income actually grows because of advanced billing. Uh, and the other side is cash. So um, that's the primary difference between the two businesses. So we finished the period with uh, 5.5 million in cash, um, having started with 7.5 million. But we, have, yeah, but we also have no borrowing facilities, which were repaid in June 2021. Um, so we're in good shape um, you know, uh, in cash-wise and ahead of our expectations. Finally, uh, balance sheet. I'm not going to talk much about this. The only thing that uh, probably highlighted the trade debt is in line two, which has jumped to a million pounds. That's not because we're not collecting our debts. That's because that's a mixture of strong contract sales where we're advancing, billing in advance, plus the growth in the business. We're up 72% in, in revenue terms. Uh, and just to, you know, uh, our debtor days, our collection periods, we actually collect on a 65 to 70 day period. Um, uh, our debts. Um, that's not bad considering a number of our channel partners uh, take 60 days credit from us. And we have minimal debt over, over 90 days, same as we you know, reported in the uh, full year to June uh, 21. Uh, and again, no bank borrowing in there. So that's it from me on the finance side. I will now hand back to James to take you through the rest. Thanks, William. Should we get to my slide? Yep. Okay. So, yeah, sales and revenue growth. It's okay. Um, so, just focusing on, on uh, the split of ACV. So, our new sales bookings in the period. Um, Amir at one million was uh, was ahead of our expectations uh, within the business for the for the half year. So, very very pleased with that. That's partly due to strong upsells in Amir as well. So, this is the um, you know direct result of. Um, of, of the strong performance of NRR, um, so the, the Emir business is more mature. So uh, we have more opportunities to upsell to those customers. So the North America number, which is all uh, US-based business, was in line with management expectations of just under 0 point, 0 point 0.8 million. Um, now uh, the vast majority of that is net new logo business, so that's all all new business. So we'll, we'll expect to see upsells coming in the US as the sort of years progress and those relationships get a little bit more more mature um, and we are on track moving into h2 with uh, with the us to expect that to to uplift in the second half um, we're starting to talk more about rarr now as well now that you know we previously talked about tacv being what arr is likely to look like but now that we're getting a slightly larger organization we are starting to focus a little more on arr uh, which is up 52 percent to 9 million um, I'm very pleased with that result there are some underlying operational uh, metrics which are performing very well and help really drive that so those that know us well will know that we've talked about our, one of our delivery metrics of TTGL time to go live which is the period of time it takes us to get from signing a contract to when it goes uh, live and is therefore at revenue recognition well we're we're inside of our management expectations for the half year uh, against that metric at uh, 22 weeks um, and, and we've got very strong uh, or high MPS scores across both implementations and our service desk areas as well. So these are net promoter scores. So this is uh, effect, a very strong indicator of customer satisfaction with us. So, you know, critical that those two metrics are, are working well for us if we're going to be able to keep customers and we're going to be able to do more with customers, which ultimately is what's driving those NRR and um, uh, minimal min, minimal uh, minimal churn rates um, in in terms of uh, average deal sizes so 
um, slightly slightly higher than uh, the year on year average, but still we're very much within the sort of 20 to 30,000 ACV mark, which, you know, that's perfectly good for us because it's targeting that small to mid size end of the market. But we do have numerous enterprise deals that we are still doing. We we haven't had necessarily any of the one off really big ones that we'd had a, a handful of in the, in the previous two years. But we've got a steady flow of 100, 150 K ACV value individual deals being done. Um, and in fact, I'll highlight one of those on, on the next slide uh, in the US, which you know, has great expansion opportunities. So in the top right of the slide there, um, it's an enterprise deal that we, we won with a very well-known uh, US headquartered pharmaceutical firm uh, with, with truly global operations. So we're going through a delivery process with them at the moment, but that is not across their entire business. So um, you know, the, the EMEA business has been successful in, in, in expanding into existing accounts, and we would now expect to start seeing that happen in the, uh, in the US as well. Um, uh, ACV sales in North America are up 14% year on year. As I said, that's slightly ahead of management expectations. So we're, we're happy with that. That's off the, the back of the same resources we had in the prior year. It's only since the further investment that we've started to escalate that, that growth. And you may remember that uh, those of you that I've spoke to before, I explained there's a, you know, there's a timing intricacy with the US. We cannot just pile money into the US and expect to return because their maturity around payment security and payment technology is a little behind some of the other markets that we're operating in. So there's a there's a timed uh, increase being built up there, but we do anticipate an uplift uh, in the second half as part of that. And of course, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did launch our Canadian operation too. So the North American business won't just be US, it will be Canada as well. And, and actually that team has uh, has already started building uh, building out pipeline, which is um, which is great to see. Um, in terms of EMEA, um, uh, I don't want to re repeat things we've, we've we've already been through, but naturally, as the more, more mature part of the business, we'll see revenue being able to increase more significantly. We'll see that starting to come through in North America across the remainder of this year. Uh, but it was great to see uh, the EMEA business EBITDA profitable. Uh, when we did the fundraise in April last year, we pushed back our cash generation points and our and our break-even points by 12 to 18 months, we told investors. And really, this is the first line in the sand of that new timeline uh, that we have hit. So, you know, we're looking 12 months out now to get to those first months of cash generative and, and break-even. And it, it doesn't actually feel that long ago that, that I was talking about that previously. So I'm, I'm very pleased that we're on track to uh, and, and in line to get to those, uh, th those break-even points as well. Um, as I said, upsell opportunities have been very strong in EMEA. Um, some great new uh, partners that we've won too. And I said I'd highlight uh, one or two of those. Um, we've won uh, two, two new uh, major BPO partners in Europe. These are big global organizations. One of them has actually got more than 200,000 call center agents across its whole group. It's one of the largest in the world. Um, and we've sold customers to both these BPOs that we signed in the same period. So it shows how quickly actually the BPOs get working. So the and the BPOs are big, big outsourcers, big outsource contact centers. But because that's mainland Europe, that's a really good indicator of our uh, capability longer term to be able to uh, use the UK to expand into mainland Europe to grow that addressable market opportunity for the uh, for the for the EMEA business. And then just finally, uh, the majority of our engineering and product core is based in the UK. And um, some of you will be aware that I hired a new CTO in May last year, who's also our uh, CPO is the chief product officer as well, uh, and, and he's been, uh, I've been working with him hiring new product uh, professionals into the business. I could not be more pleased with how that's going, uh, and I know that the management team uh, feel exactly the same about that. So um, I often say this, we obsess about hiring and we don't let people in unless we're 110% about them, and uh, I think we've got that one right. So we're very pleased with the direction that, that that's taking which in terms of an outlook, you know, we do have real confidence um, looking out, not just for the second half, but we've got, we're very excited about the, uh, the rolling five-year plan that, that, we're, that, that we're constantly evolving. Um, H2 has started very well, we're two months in now, uh, totally in line with uh, management expectations as we expect it to be. New business tracking very well, we've had a strong, strong couple of months there. Um, new hiring as well. So the new hires that we've been making as a result of the additional investment you know, they, they, they don't have an impact immediately. It takes people time to be to be onboarded, some more than others, some longer than others, depending on their role. So in H2, we'll start seeing some of the benefits of those hires, whether that be sales, whether that be product, whether that be operational. So 
It's going to be great to report on uh, that progress with you. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Australia is now active and open. So we've got a team of three out in Australia headed up by a, a VP of sales with some very specific experience of our industry. So we're hopeful of him hitting the ground running. And then, uh, as I said, I'm, I'm very positive about the, uh, the product situation at PCI Power. And we've got some uh, great product initiatives that we're working on. Uh, we're driving more pace through our, our development teams and uh, I should be in a position to provide you know, updates on, on how those initiatives are going um, throughout H2. So that's the end of the, the presentation, but very happy uh, to take some questions. Uh, great. Okay, super. Well, thank you, James. Thank you, William. Uh, now, if we could turn to the questions, um, we have a number of questions that were submitted ahead of the presentation. Um, however, please continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the top right hand corner of your screen um, I'd like to remind you that a recording of this presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard on the investor company platform um, additionally your feedback is important to the company so immediately after the presentation has ended you will be redirected for the opportunity to provide feedback um, while you're submitting questions let us first have a look at those submitted ahead of the event and you'll be unsurprised to hear there have been a couple uh, in relation to the intellectual property issue which I know James may touch on again in in a second um we have a couple that were covered in the presentation itself uh, but one very relevant that i might put to you james if i might um do you have any <laughs> i think we've all lost tom um so there were two questions that i know were going to come um one of them was related, uh, and actually we've had a number of questions through the chat as well on this topic, so I will cover it, uh, which relates to the timeline uh, with the with the patent dispute that we're dealing with, and what does that patent actually the timeline look like if we if we're not to achieve the question was if we're not to achieve any kind of settlement uh, or it finish any sooner, what would the timeline look like? Well, uh, the timeline in the UK will will be a uh, uh, court trial date is set for June next year, so 2023. Uh, and the US is um, we're unknown at this point, but uh, we're being told to anticipate probably a year after that. So we're talking mid 2024. And neither of those dates include appeal processes, by the way, which could add another 12 months plus to that. So, yeah, it's not a fast process, um, but uh, it's it's one that we're, we're in and we're going to we're, we're going through right now. Um, in terms of the uh, second question that was submitted before on the assumption that Tom's not managed to reconnect. Um, and I've had one or two questions like this, so we'll cover it, which was a question about whether we have any uh, major customers either in Russia or, or Belarus um, or many, any of our customers, were, or do we think the conflict in the Ukraine could cause us any issues? Uh, bottom line is I, I, we don't believe that the conflict in Ukraine at the, w would cause PCI power any issues. Um, it's pretty early days for us looking at um, customers that we may have that are you know, Russian by nature, but obviously that's any considerations around that we need to take, take very carefully. Um, but it is something that we're looking at and we're very mindful of what our people think of this situation, you know, working in the business. And that's not just UK, but that's US too. So that's probably almost the, the main focus point we will have is making sure that our people are feeling OK about it because there's a lot of anxiety flying around around this situation right now. But from a business standpoint, I don't have any major concerns. Jumping to the questions, um, there's a number of questions on here which probably require slightly more complex answers. So we're going to take some of those afterwards and we'll respond to them in the portal. Um, so we have a question here from Morgan, which is how do you plan to manage your bottom, bottom line loss going forward? Top line growth is good, but bottom line growth with a path to profitability is even better. OK, so I would say that we do have the latter. So we, we have top line growth and we do have a path to profitability. We moved that, uh, that profitability point out when we did the fundraise in April. Why did we do that? We did that because we were expanding our addressable market. So we needed to invest more to keep the growth rates going. So for us, what we said to investors at the time was that th that was to enable us to keep the 30 to 40 percent minimum revenue growth going, not just for the next two years, but three years onwards is what we're looking at. So that's why we did that. And as I said in the presentation, we're tracking very well to get to our first months of cash generation, followed by um, uh, uh, profit. Uh, in the business uh, in the second half of FY23. Uh, I'm just quickly assessing the other questions. 
Yeah, well, I think that's it for the questions now, actually. That, that's great. Um, James, thank you very much indeed. And um, thank you for stepping in. We, we did lose Tom um, momentarily. Um, I know investor feedback is going to be important to you guys, and I will shortly redirect investors to provide you with their thoughts and expectations. And of course, we'll, we'll make all these questions, should any more come through available to you as well, post the, the call. But uh, if I may, um, James, just hand back to you for a few closing comments. And then, as I say, I'll redirect investors to provide you with their thoughts and expectations. Okay, great. Well, I hope that today's been useful. Uh, we're, as always, we're really trying to be as transparent as we are. We appreciate the feedback and uh, we hope the metrics are helping you uh, 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 figure out where you, where you think we're going to get to and whether you agree with uh, uh, what, the, uh, what the forecasts are saying. Uh, but we'll keep our heads down and we'll keep, uh, keep delivering as best we can and we look forward to updating you in the second half. That's great. James, William, thank you very much indeed once again for updating investors this afternoon. Can I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of PCI Pal PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session, so good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Thanks all.